at the twilight's last gleaming and the rocket's red <laughs> glare, the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that the flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave over the land of the brave and the home of the free? Or the land of the free and the home of the brave. There we go. Hey, there we go. A little bit of patriotism today. A uh, little bit of celebrating the freedom that we enjoy. Unprecedented freedom. Never known in the history of all written and a in history, like we have never known a freedom like this, right, Steve? All right, I'll get off my uh, my platform there. There we go. I told Steve, I said, "Hey, they won't let us do the Star Spangled Banner. YouTube and Facebook will take down the recording." So I came on, given my version of the Star Spangled Banner. Hey, how you doing, everybody? My name's Dave, and this is Steve Edwards. Every Wednesday, we get together to talk mules and donkeys. Today, we've got a special invitation for you. Coming up on the 17th of November, we are hosting an event, Mule and Donkey Bits, everything you need to know. And uh, if the kids are in the air area, you may want to know that because I'm about to drop an F-bomb. It's going to be free. You can attend absolutely free. We're going to talk about uh, bits. We're going to talk about ugly bits, pretty bits, big bits, little bits, um, all different types of bits. So if you have a question of what's the right bit for the job or what bit should I be riding with or is the bit that I'm using okay or any other question that has the word bit in it, even if you're just wondering, can I hang out for a little bit? Yes, you can. We want you to come hang out with us on the 17th. I'm going to put a link in the comment section. Registration's free. It really would be great uh, to have you join us. Everything you need to know about mule and donkey bits. Uh, this is a great opportunity to invite friends and family to join you. If you've got some friends and family uh, who are thinking about getting into mules and donkeys or even just the equine world. Come and hang out with us. It's going to be a lot of fun. We always enjoy spending some time together and uh, you'll walk away uh, with more information uh, so that you can have confidence with your bit and experience the control and refined communication that comes along with it. Steve, how are you today? Well, I got another good day started. It, um, it's been pretty cool around here in the morning. It's been nice. And uh, been taking Jess out and working his sheep. I've got five sheep that we use and kind of keep him tuned up. I'm hoping yeah. my buddy Randy will beat this uh, cancer and, and uh, get out on the trail again. Yep. We do hope that. If you're a praying person, we appreciate you lifting up, uh, lifting up our friend in prayer. And uh, just ask that God would have his way and then let it be known that uh, we want healing. We're, we're calling on healing. And, uh, Randy's a great man. If you've been to some of Steve's clinics, you've met Randy, uh, just a great friend as well. Super kind, uh, very kind to my kids whenever we're around. So, um, yeah, totally agree with you. Well, folks, the way this works, if you are just joining us, you're going to want to know the first thing that we ask is that you put your name, where you're watching from, and what the weather's like in the comments section. We want to know that you're here. We want to say hello. And we want to uh, know that we're not alone. Now, know that we're not just here talking to the sky or talk, talking to Mark Zuckerberg or the YouTube you know, giants. We want to know that you're here listening to us. So put your name, where you're watching from, what the weather's like. You can already see some folks doing that. Second thing, ask any and every mule question that you've got. Even if it's about bits, the answer may be sign up for November 17th, but... We will definitely get you an answer. We'll do better than that. We'll get you an answer on any and everything that you need. And then the third thing is we ask that you share the broadcast. Y'all have been doing a great job of this. All you need to do to share the broadcast, if you're on Facebook, just click the thumbs up button and click the share button. And if you're on YouTube, click the like button, the thumbs up button on YouTube and subscribe. That lets YouTube know that other folks might find what we're doing interesting. And, and you guys are really in control of that 100%. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about pawing. We've talked about that before. We're going to talk about uh, administering shots uh, for your animals, the best way to do that. We're going to talk about uh, the Bureau of Land Management uh, boroughs. So, uh, so that's the other BLM. So the Bureau of Land Management. We're going to talk about them. And uh, we're going to talk about your 
uh, your questions, what you've got. So let's say hello to our friends. First, we've got Matt and Zach, Matt with Zach the Mule in Nikon, South California, 70 degrees and beautiful. Hey, we've got our first international Faye is here. Good day from hot and humid Queensland, Australia. David O'Brien is here. David, good to hear from you. Good to have you here. East Texas, very nice, 69 degrees. We got a needed inch of rain last night. Hallelujah, The rain. let the rain come down. Carolyn is watching, drinking coffee always. Steve, let's do a toast to Carolyn. All right, here we go, toast. To you, Carolyn. Mm. There we go. Always, uh, always enjoying your show in Minnesota. Thank you, Carolyn. We're glad you're here. Roger in Milan, New York is here, 52 degrees and windy. Samantha, hello, and thank you from Woodcrest, California. You're welcome. I guess just showing up is all we had to really do, so you're welcome. Hopefully, it'll get better from here. Fiona is watching from rainy and storming 18 degrees Celsius. South Victoria, we've gone international again. South Victoria, uh, Australia, here for 10 minutes, and I've got to go get my mule ready for a lesson today. Well, we don't want to keep anybody from enjoying their mule, so do what you got to do and come watch the replay. Levi is watching from Van Cleek Hill, Ontario, Canada. Hey, man, I think our international viewers are uh, out outnumbering our domestic viewers here. Of course, it's not international for them. It's domestic for them. Ontario, Canada, 10 degrees today and cloudy, usually coming from Albert County, New Brunswick, but here for work. Stay safe, Levi, on the road. Brazil is watching from Enoch, Utah. Fall is finally here. Amen. Cool day out here with a slight breeze. Uh, KK is watching from Red Lodge, uh, let's see, Montana, uh, sunny and 40 degrees. And uh, Laura says she's watching near Nashville, Tennessee. Just visited Red Rock Canyon on a trip to Las Vegas. They have BLM burrows there. So I am looking forward to today's discussion. Well, I'm glad that you're here. It sounds like it's working out just perfectly. So go ahead, get those questions into the comment section. We're going to start off today's show with a question about pawing. This one comes from Julie. Julie sent in an email to us and asked the question, I've had my mule for two weeks. I've been doing your groundwork and riding, so good job there. She is starting to come around nice, but I'm having issues with pawing. I do always tie her for a few hours after working and only untie her until she stands quiet for a while. Just wondering if there's anything else I should do or do I need to give more time? Previous owner said she never had issues with pawing, but she was always tied with other mules. Sincerely, thank you, Julie. Okay, pine. It's a normal thing that mules, donkeys all do, uh, even horses. Now, why do they paw? Paw because they want something. If there's snow on the ground, they want to get to the grass, they paw the snow out of the way. If the water is frozen and they need a drink of water, they break the ice. If they don't want to, if they don't like what they're doing in the way of standing tied to a hitching post, they'll paw until you take them off. If the lady said, never had that problem before, um, wrong, all mules, all donkeys paw, all of them do. Now, they may not paw if they got their buddy next to them, because then uh, they're not there by themselves, okay? So is tying them up to a hitching rail a good deal? Yes. Is tying them up to a, to a, uh, a uh, trailer, that's good too. Tying them to a tree, tie them, tie them, tie them, tie them, tie them. Yes, good, okay. Can they, you fix the, the pawing uh, and well, they don't paw no more? Nope, nope. That's what God give them. God give them that thing right there to tell, to, to tell you and to also to let them know themselves that they paw to get what they want. So uh, how do we take and we fix, uh, you know what we ought to do sometime, Dave, maybe you may even have it on a video already, or not video, but a picture, the picture of my hitching post with the rubber mats. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know if the one picture that we have, anyway, it doesn't make any different things to rubber mats. First thing you do, folks, is make sure that your halter is adjusted correctly. Why is that? Because when the mule moves to the right, he hits the halter on his nose and it bumps his nose. 
If he moves to the left, it hits the halter on the left and bumps his nose. If he pulls back, it puts him behind his ears and, and bumps his, his pole. So at the same time, with the pine, you can teach them to stand still and not pull on your, your lead rope. Now, I strongly always suggest that you chain a, a chain to the hitching post if you're going to let them stand for a long time because they will eat a good hitching rail. I mean, eat it right down to nothing. So here's what I do. Uh, I don't think we have any pictures yet. Or, or yeah, do we have pictures of that uh, pawing chain uh, that uh, Randy had sent us? With uh, the let me with let me see if I can find them. Go ahead and the orange. It would be the orange uh, hobble that goes just above uh, the the knee. What you do is you put a hobble just above the knee. And we've got one design. It's a really great hobble that you take loose really easy. Anyway, you put it just above the knee on the right and left leg. And then there's a chain that's about <clears throat> 10 inches or so. That's a heavy chain that attaches to each hobble. As the mule paws, the hobble, the chain, hits the mule on the cannonball. And when it does that, it makes them uncomfortable to where they don't want to use pawing to get what they want and they stand still. Now here's, here's what you got to do. Mules are really good at playing poker with you. Uh, here's what I mean by that. Just a split second, the split second, they stop pawing. Go over, pet them, good for you, mule, good for you. There's the set of hobbles right there. Uh, uh, and, and you pet them and you take off the hobble. Now, you put one hobble on each leg and you take away the center length. And then you hang a chain from the hobble and that bangs on them. That's what we got to do, Dave. I was thinking that uh, Randy had sent us a picture of the hobble on the mule's leg. So when they paw, it shows it. Uh, I'll contact Randy if we don't have it. So anyway, that's what you do. Here's what you do, folks. You put the hobble on. When they quit pawing, take it off and just kind of hang it right there close to where the mule can see it. The mule's going to think, okay, when I paw, you put it on, I'm going to be uncomfortable. You remember the life of an equine is comfortable, uncomfortable. So you make them uncomfortable when they are pawing. Now, here's the thing with these mules. <laughs> You can move them five feet to the right or to the left, forward or back, and it's another whole new world. You'll have to put the chain on again. You got them tied to a trailer, put the pawing chain on them. You got them tied to the inside of the trailer, put the pawing chain on them. When you do that, it's going to get them to understand that when they paw at that spot, you are going to make them uncomfortable. When they choose, to not paw, you're going to take it off. There you're showing leadership, comfortable, uncomfortable, and you're showing them that it, it's not respectful to paw at this place. All right, so I'm back. Sorry about that. Uh, let's see here, back to live mode. That was a good looking guy there. Hey. Well, so I was working on getting your uh, working on getting your hitching post here. Do you see that? So there's the hitching post. That's the best. That's the best one I could find. But you got the chain right there hooked up. Can you see mm -hmm. that, Steve? Yeah, I see it. You see the 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 rubber mat in the background there off of my left shoulder. Oh yeah, I do see that. Okay, you see that's that's where a mule would get chained, would tie, it. and I use the chains. Now again, folks. Only reason I do that is because folks tie to a hitching post. So part of my training is tie to a hitching post. What is my preference? Come along hitch only. I come up, I throw the rope on the ground and the mule stands still and I do all of my brushing, everything. There's a challenge for you folks. When you're brushing, don't tie them, use the come along hitch and the ultimate goal is not, get this, is not brushing. 
The ultimate goal, goal is they don't move their feet. Get that? They don't move while you're brushing them. So you do all your brushing and everything without them being tied. That is what's called, that's true halter training, folks, when they don't move until you ask them to move. That's what you should do. There we go. We got more folks uh, tuning in and hanging out with us here. We've got uh, Tamar from Australia. Hey, international again. We've got uh, Sherman Johnson from Johnson's Taxidermy hanging out. We've got Mark coming in from Aguana, California, sunny and warm. Samantha is watching, said, sent, a, sent an image via messenger. My husband, Bob, my husband got Bob all tacked up and we've been doing weekly family rise thanks to you dave and steve my hubby is comfy bob the mule is amazing and comfortable it's been such a blessing that's probably that i mean that's why we show up every single week we want y'all to get out there and make like those it. lifelong family memories that's great um yeah it's yep. not about the mules it's not about the donkeys it's not about riding it's about creating an experience and creating a bond between you and creation, whether that's your friends, your family, or the animals. Matt says, Zach Mule spends most of the year in a large herd. The rest of the year, he rides in big groups. Are there any ways to get him better while riding alone on the trail? He's very herd bound and he's about 15 years old. Herd bound is part of life. Birds of a feather flock together, folks. Keep that in your mind. Now notice that when the animals, and I'm just going to touch on this a little bit because that book has always been true. Notice how the animals came off of the ark two by two. It wasn't a giraffe and a chimpanzee. It was a giraffe and a giraffe, chimpanzee. Ch Got the point? Okay. Here's the thing. When it comes down to an equine, very, very important for you to understand. The herd mentality is part of what put the God put in their mind. He did that because they are the bottom of the food chain. Get that in your mind. Bottom of the food chain. Okay. And since they're the bottom of the food chain, they always have something looking to eat them. Okay. So, so if I've, if I've got old scout out in front, and he's out in the very front, and the rest of us mules are in the back. Old Scout's ears are straight up, straight up, looking all around. What's going on here? All of a sudden, old Scout goes, whoop. What's that? What's that? What's that? And everybody else goes, hey, wait, wait a minute. Scout says there's a problem here. Well, you see, Scout keeps an eye on things. That's the lead mule. All the other mules, their ears are flopping, and they're doing good. But when Scout or the leader says there's a problem, they start paying attention. That's the idea. You are scout. When you are riding your mule, folks, it's up to you to be the leader. You don't let them look to the right. Bump them center. They don't look them, let them look to the left. Bump them center. Don't let them look up and say, oh, what's that? Right, left, right, left. Bring the head down. Okay? Got the idea? But if you allow them to look around, and look for monsters. That's what they do. They're looking for something that's going to eat them. If you look around, let them look around, they're, <coughs> they're going to find all kinds of monsters. So, okay, here's the deal. You've got to ride them. As they progress, as you, the two of you become one, okay? Uh, you're, the, you're the herd leader. He's the herd of one. As you're riding along with your hands, and you're riding along with your hands. And all of a sudden, old mule looks off like this. Well, then you bump him straight. In the very beginning, two hands. He looks off to the right, you bump him on the left. He looks off to the left, you bump him on the right, okay? You make the left or the right or over there uncomfortable. He thinks, I've gotta be comfortable and keep an eye on things to keep it from eating on me. Get that in your mind, folks. Okay. Don't, this ain't your car. Now, I, I, now, let's just do it this way. Let's make it your car. Let go of the steering wheel. Don't touch the brakes and see where your car goes. Yeah. Yeah. It ain't going to be pretty. That's the same thing with the mule, folks. 
Oh, the mule knows all about it. Yeah, he knows. But you need to pay attention to being the herd leader. He needs, once the two of you start getting together, you can do a whole lot less to get a whole lot more. So going back to this, you can't put him in a separate corral. You can't put him in a separate pasture because the split second they're apart or the split second they're together, everything's going to be the way they want it. Okay. When they're apart, they're going to throw a fit. I've had them rear up. Actually, I'll tell you a secret. Now, this is before the steed that you see now. I had a lot of anger at times when an animal wouldn't pay attention to me. And I was out quail hunting with my son. And I should have never done this. But anyway, I took that shotgun and I busted it over the mule's head and broke the stock of my shotgun. Yeah, I was stupid. Yeah, that's why I got 32 broken bones and two replaced hips because of being younger and dumber. So let's go on. So you can't change any of that. You can't put them someplace, but what you can do is ride them. All right. And, and it don't make any difference. They're 15 years old. I have trained a lot of older mules and they got to where they listen to me. Number one, do your ground communication kit, Lord. Guys, I mean, <laughs> sorry, everybody, all of you, you need to understand that you want to perfect the communication between you and your mule. It's imperative you start on the ground. Mules care more about their nose than they do their mouth. Same thing with your donkey. Same thing. Do your ground communication. Get them to listen to you. This is what's going to happen. You're going to refine your touch with your hands. The slightest bump then will get communication. Right now, you got to bump pretty hard. But as you get going, as you get better, this is not the mule's fault. This is your fault. It's my fault for not being a good communicator. Okay, so do your groundwork. Use that come along hitch. Use the come along hitch. Not so much the halter, the come along hitch. Okay, that will help you tune up good. Now, next thing, mule riders martingale. Put them in a sur single. Turn them loose. Let them get soft in the face. The majority of mules out there are because we, they do not have a soft face. We are using horse bits, and we're going to talk about that in this program. They're using horse bits, horse communication, like smooth snaffle bits, and anyway, a lot of wrong stuff, <clears throat> which you're going to see. And you they got to get soft in the face, and you do that without you, without you touching a bit. You put them in a surf single, put them in the martingale, and turn them loose. Let them figure out where to pack the bit. Let them figure out where to get their nose. Nobody's on their back. Watch the video. You'll see it. Now, we go from there. Sir Single. Mule Riders Martingale. Then we go from there in the saddle. Mule Riders Martingale. I'm going to ride in that Martingale for the next six months. Consistently. I'm not going to get in the saddle without it. I'm going to go. Now, after six months, you build a firm foundation. Yes, you can go to the trail rider bit. Yes, you can. Okay. Now, that doesn't say that you're now going to be permanently in that trail rider bit, finished bit. Nobody's ever in a finished per permanent bit ever. You're always going to have to go back to the mule riders martingale and get a retune to get them light. Why is that? Because of your hands. Your hands incorrectly communicate to your mule and your donkey, it's not their fault, it is yours. The more you perfect your hands, the better you're going to be. There we go. You uh, you wanted an answer there, friend. Uh, you and Zach got the answer, so hopefully that'll help you guys out big time, Matt. Uh, hey, Linda, the mule servant, and Theo, the extra sweet one-eyed mule from rainy, chilly, rural central Ohio, uh, drinking something that's not coffee, but a salud anyhow. So good to have you here, Linda. Glad you're joining us. Steve, which of your mules customized the brim of your hat so nicely? <laughs> well, <laughs> it wasn't so much the mules as it was mesquite. Lots of mesquite. Or I take it off and slap a cow in the face, you know, something like that. So 
Yeah, it uh, it got customized by the uh, mesquite trees and things like that. Yep. There you go, Linda. If you want that customization, find yourself some cows and mesquite trees and you'll be well on your way. Uh, let's see. AZ Highland says, howdy, y'all. Good to have you here, AZ. Linda is watching from Vanceboro, North Carolina. Rob says, hi, from Queen Valley, Arizona. Steve, I love the hat. Beautiful day in Queen Valley. Who is that? Rob Langfeld. Oh, Rob. Hey, Rob, I got my I got my uh, Ranger fix. You need to call me. There we go. We're making we're making things happen here. Tony is watching from Port Angeles, Washington, 56 degrees and cloudy. Kim says hello from Courage Rock, Indiana. We have a BLM Mustang, and I love hearing Steve's advice. That also helps with our pilot veterans Mustang program. What's a BLM Mustang, Steve? Is that just a Bureau of Land Management horse? They got those too. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, Bureau of Land Management, yeah, has been around for a lot of years. And they call them Mustangs, folks. They're just a feral horse that the Indians had turned loose, the, the different reservations around. They just turn them loose. And anyway, you end up with what you got. And that is uh, a feral horse. Your true Mustangs, listen, listen look this up. Geiger is called Geiger Mustang. They're the only ones that are the true Mustang that are still out there. They're actually on an island. There are a few people who have them here on the States that are riding them. And some I've heard about breeding. I don't know. Okay. But look it up, the Geiger Mustang. So let's go back. Uh, what, what can I help you with on that Mustang? What are the thoughts? Well, I think she says she's just here, always interested to hear it. So we will talk about BLM burrows here uh, pretty soon. Yeah. I do have a question that did come in over on YouTube. Sarah left a comment on one of our videos. She says, okay, I just adopted a mini mule from a rescue. She has been in a cruelty situation. I don't know any further details. She has bonded with my old thoroughbred and pals around with my pony mare as well. I just can't get near her. I have them on a large property where I live. They are in a pasture and she gets out to graze. I have tried to put a lunge line on her, uh, but she pulls me all over. I have tried to put her in several pin configurations, but she gets so upset I'm worried she will hurt herself. Eventually, she will bust out. The few times I have caught her, she has fairly good manners with a halter. She will lead, back up, move on her hind end, etc. However, after a session like that, she won't let me catch her for weeks. She needs to have her feet done right now. She will come into the barn with the other two, but if I try and get close, she runs back out. If I trap her by closing the gate, she won't come in for a good while. Any suggestions? She's got her hand full there, Steve. What would you say to Sarah? Well, yeah. <coughs> And a lot of people think it's an abusive situation. Uh, but you and I know, Dave, the abusive situation to me is uh, putting on a wrong halter, putting yeah. on a nylon halter, yep. putting on a horse bit. That's to me is abuse. Letting right? them eat too much, uh, letting them founder, letting them colic and not caring yeah. about their nutrition. That, I mean, that's, a, that's part of some of the worst abuse you can get because you got to put them down after that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it can be tough. So, yes, you need to get them trimmed up and stuff. Folks, get this in your mind. Herd mentality. Yes, they will bond to another horse, just like a giraffe will go to another giraffe. Elephant will go to another elephant. An elephant's not going to go to a lion, all right? It ain't going to happen. Well, it will someday. I understand my reading, but it's another story. But here, listen to this, folks. If you're going to fix and help your mule out that you have, that you feel has had some problems, abuse or whatever, you cannot put them in a pen with other animals. Put them in a safe pen, a metal pen, or someplace safe, not barbed wire with T-post, anything like that, okay? But a safe pen and leave them there, okay? Oh, but Steve, you don't understand. He's running and running and running and running and braying and throwing a fit. Tough. Okay. You want to fix the problem? They've gotten their way time and time again. And here it is. They're right back to doing it again. You need 
to toughen up. Put this animal in a small pen and make it rely on you. For, folks, here we go again. The herd mentality, you need to be the herd leader. If you got this meal and you took it out of an abusive situation and you, you're, you're trying to help it out, all right, you want my advice? My advice is don't play fluffy, fluffy with it. You put this meal in a small pen, 10 by 10 pen is the smallest, 10 by 20 is my preference. 20 by 20 is the biggest. Smaller the better, all right? And you, 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 you've got to do that. And then when you feed it, when you go to take the feed, if the meal goes away, you don't put the feed down there. They have to see you come with that feed and come to you. They don't come to you, you put the feed down. Oh, they'll get hungry. Not for long, you know. It ain't going to be for long. They're, they're not stupid, folks. These mules are really smart. Folks have taught this mule to get away with what it's doing now. And when you put it with another horse, you're just giving it what it does naturally. You're giving it what it wants. It does not want to be around you. You need to put them in a small pen. You take care of the feeding program so that you can take care of their feet, get their teeth done, things like this. Uh, when you get them from these auction houses and this sort of thing, you never know what kind of life they've had. We've got an article. I'll put a link in the comment section, but it's how to buy a mule at auction or on Craigslist. And uh, there's a lot of really good stuff to take a look there. We talk about abuse a little bit in there as well. But there's a lot of good stuff to take a look. And if you're considering going down that path, considering getting any type of mule, these are the things that you want to look for, even if you're trying to, you know, go after them in a recovery type of situation. So great question, Sarah. Glad you asked it. Um, let's continue uh, to just say hey to everyone who is hanging out with us. Uh, we've got uh, Tony hanging out from 56 and Cloudy, Port Angeles, Washington. Uh, we've got Kim watching from Courage Rock, Indiana. Oh, Bert, okay. I've already said hello here. Let's scroll, scroll back down. Uh, let's see. Brazil says, I can't wait to hear you talk about the BLM burrows. I've gentled down round over 100 BLM burrows for programs I work in like TIP to get them adopted. And I own 11 of them personally. That's a lot of love right there. BLM burrows are the best rides and can do anything a horse or mule can do. I ride my favorite BLM burrow Goku in Steve's cowboy saddle and it fits them perfectly. The original ATV for sure. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and bring up the BLM question that we got. This is a little bit of a reader, Steve. Um, but I, I think folks will enjoy hearing it and, uh, and, and I'll try and, you know, get through it quickly. This one comes from Karen. Uh, she says, we adopted three BLM wild burrows. Impetus was that one of our two horses just died and it's a longtime companion. My wonderful mountain mare was pretty despondent. Since I want to take time to find the right new horse for us, I decided to get a couple companions for Smokey. Two, because when we do get our second riding horse, I want the burrows to have company while we are out in the mountains. I did some quick ramp up on burrow needs and viability with horses and then spent two hours picking out three different personality burrows from pens. I don't know about the BLM program. These were just listed on Craigslist. There we go. I had the suggestion from our vet that I needed to do the same groundwork for the burrows as we have four or four uh, horses, even if I don't ride them and maybe only day pack with them so they can be helped if sick and have their hooves handled. I pretty much knew this and since we just retired a new a winter spring project like our corral, we are not riding in the snow, seemed like a good idea. The guy holding the BLM burrows put halters and lead ropes optum in the chute, suggesting that we start by training them uh, up a couple of hours each morning and move to the usual flag touching training. So here we are now and the fun begins. I've ridden horses since a child, but I'm not a trainer. I did some groundwork years ago after, so, after someone gave me an unhandled gelding, gelding a couple weeks of initial work. Um, all also from what I've read, I get that burrows are not horses. I don't want to make a lot of mistakes as I started their groundwork. So can you please help? Here's what she says. I'll, I'll, let's go through her questions one, and then I'll go through the second. First, what are the differences in personality between donkeys and mules? 
and how will that change their training? Most of your info seems to be on mules with the goal of riding them. When you say a mule only needs to be told something X times and not for a whole long time at once, does that go for burrow? So that's question one, Steve. What do you say? Okay, here's the thing. Anytime I say mule, just say donkey. Anytime I say donkey, just think mule, all right? Now, the, if I'm going to say there's anything that really separates the donkey and the mule, it's the, the sullenness. It looks like you look into a, a donkey's eye and there's nothing there. Hello? Anybody in there? And the donkey just kind of sits there. You just get done doing some work with a donkey and you're thinking, he ain't got it. A couple of days later, he'll show you how it's done. Yeah, they're good. Now, do I train groundwork uh, like uh, horses? No, no, and no. You'll always know a horse trainer working with a mule when they, or a donkey, when they start saying, now disengage the hindquarters, and do this, and they look at the hindquarter, and the hindquarter moves over. No, 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 folks. This is a mule, a donkey. You disengage shoulders, not hindquarters. Now, let's see if hindquarters really works good. I'm on the side of a mountain. Oh, wait a minute. Let's just go to the Grand Canyon. It's straight off here. It's straight up here. How can I disengage a hindquarter to get one to stop? Oh, wait a minute. I got five mules behind me that I'm packing. Do you see what I'm saying? Folks, when you hear a person that's supposed to be a mule trainer, you go to a clinic and they tell you to disengage hindquarters. Yeah, it may look good. You're thinking, boy, I got the deal. But wait till you try to stop it one day. It'll run just as fast through its shoulder as it does straight ahead because you try to stop it with one hand and disengage your hindquarter. You go to a clinic where they tell you to disengage hindquarters, that clinician does not understand the mind of a donkey and then place that into the mule. Get that in your mind. If your trainer says, put your halter on, looks like this, and the knots are way up above here on the bone and not down here on the nose where it should be, that's a horse trainer. That is not a mule trainer. They would understand that on a mule, mules care more about their nose than they do their mouth. Where'd they get that? Daddy the donkey. Very, very sensitive about that. So that's why you have to use a properly adjusted halter to get response with that respect, okay? So there you are, that's some general things. Do you use a smooth snap a bit? Nope, all you're gonna do is create problems. Again, folks, you think you're doing good. You think you're doing good. And then all of a sudden one day, the mule or the donkey blows up, and you try to disengage your hind quarter and you can't stop them. So then question number two says, most of the info starts far, seems to start far enough. None of the info seems to start far enough at the beginning for us. Our burrows hadn't been handled at all. They have a couple of weeks now getting accustomed to us. I've been giving them treats. I know, I know as a way for me to get start for me to start being able to rub their heads, chins, necks. The one that we were able to tie, I can use my hands on his body when tied and I can touch him with the whip or the flag on his belly and legs and he will follow me short difference if I lightly shake his lead rope, but it will freak out if I give even a tug. But boy, for all of them, that flight response, any slightly new thing, different side, too quick motion, it's amazing. So where is the absolute beginning? They don't know what they're doing here, Steve, and she's she's proud to say it. She doesn't want to get hurt. She doesn't want to make mistakes. How, how do we go all the way back to the very, very beginning for them? Folks, forget about the halter. Get that out of your mind. Don't tie your donkey, your mule to the hitching rail. There's where you're going to get hurt, okay? You see this right here? You see that notch right there in my head right there? You see that? right there. See that? That notch is from a paw, from a good mule that was coming up to be a world champion. I was dumb enough to allow my apprentice to time there while I was doing a couple of things. And the paw come up and whacked me in the head. Go back. Only use the come along hitch. When you're going to do your flagging, when you're going to do your touching with the whip, things like this, 
come along hitch. Why is that? Because it communicates to the nose and behind the pole. But most of all, what it does is it gives release. You see, this donkey needs to know he done right. And he knows that when there's no pressure on him. So when, when he does correct and the come along hitch gets loose, he says, oh, that's what I'm looking for. Comfortable, comfortable, uncomfortable. Now listen, will that come along rope move up and down the nose? Yeah, in the very beginning, you're bouncing pretty hard. And especially when you've got a little donkey, it's, it's, it's a lot tougher because you're up here, they're down here, and yes, it's gonna move up and down. You'll get to where you barely touch the rope with response and respect. Get that in your mind, okay? There you go. So where would I start? Ground communication kit, okay? And folks, forget about the halter. Do your brushing, do your saddling, do your harnessing, do your picking up your feet. Uh, the one video that Dave can show you here of me working with a mule that won't let me pick up his back feet. Notice I do not have him tied. Notice I am using the come along hitch only. That's what you do. Okay. That's what you do. Use the come along hitch. And what this is going to do, it's going to help your timing. And folks, that's the biggest problem that you're going to have to fight is your timing. The donkey has already moved. And there you go. Okay. Oh, that one, that one's where I first had him tied. Okay. Then he pulls away. I'll wait a second. Then he pulls away and gives me a fuss. Notice the rubber mats. Okay. Notice he pulls away. And I said, all right, that's enough. Now watch this. That mule's wanting to bite me even. Now, notice the come along hitch. Notice. Not tied. Notice I'm tapping the leg to pick up the back foot, teaching the mule to pick up the foot. Notice the come along hitch. It's only hanging there loose. I had already worked with this mule to get this mule to listen with the come along hitch. And that's why she's standing still. You see that, folks? This mule is standing still, not tied, relaxed, listening. Look at them ears. Those are listening ears. And what I'm doing is I'm teaching this mule pick up the, the foot. And when he does, look, I brush him, tell him good job, good view. Now look, I throw the whip down. Notice the come along hitch is loose. Now what am I doing? I'm picking up the foot. Notice he's not tied. And the mule's going, what the heck are you doing? Now notice, notice. Oh, look, I'm picking up the foot. I'm working on the foot. Is the mule tied? No. Do you see a rope halter? No. What do you see? Come along work, come along work, come along work. Anybody, folks, can make one's feet move. But very few folks can get one to make their feet stand still and quiet, to pick up the feet or do whatever. Now, let me go back in time here a little bit. Let me just one time here, Dave. I'm at Bishop at the World Championships. There's over a hundred mules turned loose in there. There are 10 teams at four people a team. There's 40 people loose in there. These animals are running everywhere. There's over 10,000 people in the audience. Loud music going on. Things that you don't normally see on the trail. You see me put my hand up. You see my horse come to me. When that horse comes to me, so does my pack mules. Pack mules, they come over and stand. They put the halter on them because they are halter trained because of the come along hitch. Notice that my mule, that's the lead mule, has only the come along hitch. Now watch, they are packing, putting saddles on, putting pack equipment, throwing all that stuff on there. And all them animals are running around, but their mules are so in tuned and respectful of that halter Notice now I say halter because now they are halter broke. They're not halter broke because you can lead them. They're halter broke when they're under pressure. Okay. Now we packed those five mules. We saddled those three horses and we went around a half mile track at 58 sets, five minutes, 42 seconds. 
That's a half mile run plus pack, packing five mules, saddling two horses, three horses. Okay. Them animals didn't stand still, didn't, didn't move. I mean, why? Come along, Hitch. You just saw it right there. It's the perfect thing. Folks, forget about the halter. Don't tie him. Do all your work without it. So she asked a little bit about, uh, do you have videos on starting work when they're tied? I think we covered that. Don't, don't do that. Uh, Steve talked about that uh, indirectly and directly. But the last one she asks, I've printed out of tons of info about what not to feed the burrows. Do you have any suggestions on low calorie training treats if your process allows for treats at all? Steve, can you give treats to these burrows? You see me, this finger right here is missing into this finger. You know why? That's because I put my finger up and he bit the end of it off. No treats, no treats. Folks, it's the best way I know to get yourself hurt. I had a client that used to put a carrot in her pocket and she used to think it was the greatest thing in the world for her mule to go over and get that carrot out of her pocket. One day, the carrot wasn't there and her breast was. Figure the rest of that out. I had one person one time, just a small lady, less than 100 pounds. She was leading a 17-hand Clydesdale. It's a monstrous horse, 2,000 pounds. She had a chain through his mouth, and I mean, she was, for her 100 pounds, all she could do to make him stand still. I put my come-along hitch on that horse, and he didn't move his feet. Why did I tell you that story? Not only because of the improper training, but she was missing the top part of her finger. It was gone. Why? One day she went up and she went to pet the horse on the nose. The carrot wasn't there, but the finger was. She shook that thing all around and broke the end of it off. And she's now missing part of her finger. Listen, this is the only way I'm going to give a treat. And the only reason I do this is because I've got one that doesn't want to be around me in the very beginning. I understand. I'm a predator. Lady, you're a predator. Folks, you're all predators. You're all predators. You've got a prey animal that does not trust you. And you have to build that trust. Now, it's, it's to their belly that we're building that trust. So when I give a treat, now listen to this, and you want to get want to wean off of it. When I give a treat, I give it to them and I hand it toward their shoulder toward their belly. So they have to go away from me to get to the treat. I don't want them coming in in my space and getting the treat. You watch, there's, there's one particular trainer and she's got a bag right here full of grain and stuff. And she's just giving that grain away saying, oh man, look at here, look how, well, you don't see some of the stuff that I've seen because I know this trainer, okay? And I know some of the people that's trained under and I'm just, I've seen them get hurt. It's easy enough to get hurt. But when you got these animals mauling you to get to the treats, wrong decision. They have to take the treat moving away from you. So you hand them the treat. You hand it toward their, their, their shoulders, their chest. They back away from it. And then they get their treat with an open hand. Open hand, okay? Carrots is the only thing that I would suggest that you give. There's a lot of treat folks out there that's got all kinds of companies that have all kinds of treats, okay? There's nothing wrong with an apple or a carrot, natural, okay? Is there a little bit more sugar in that? Yeah, but not enough to be concerned about. Let's go back. Then I want to minimize that treats. I want to get to where they're not there anymore. I've had, I've had at the Phoenix Zoo, we had a really good program with mules and had a, a rock wall that they could stand the kids up and get their pictures, you know? And great big sign, four by eight sign, white with red and yellow letters. Four by eight sign. They have to go past it to get to the mules. It said, do not feed the mules. Can't get much plainer than that. People would get up pieces of grass. They'd give them popcorn. 
and we started getting people bit, started getting kids hurt, started getting people hurt, and they took the mules out of the public. Yeah, I was irritated about that. Okay, Dave, did I get that question answered? Yep, we nailed it. I think folks are really going to like that a lot. Um, there's a lot of interest around the BLM boroughs. And uh, quite frankly, a lot of folks don't know about them. And when they discover that that's a program that the Bureau of Land Management has going on, they can there can be some real hidden gems there, a lot of really neat things you can do with them. So thanks so much for bringing up that question. I uh, hope that helps. Let's get back to our uh, uh, regularly scheduled comments right here. We've got a bunch of comments coming in. Uh, this one is from Michelle says, hi, Stephen Dave from sunny Florida. We've got Myra watching from cool and sunny Southern California. The better I get at working with her, the more I find how much my new mule already knows. Mark is watching. Uh, Charlene is watching from Thornville, Ohio. Michelle says, thanks, Steve, for looking at the video of the mule I sent you and your advice. That's right, folks. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to Steve directly, and uh, he'll be happy to do that. Uh, let's see. Can I touch on that a minute, Dave? Yeah, go for it. I'll take just a minute. Okay, folks, I don't mind looking at a mule for you. Be happy to. You want to send me a video and send me some things, be happy to look at it. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Don't even bother sending me a video if all they're doing is riding back and forth. She sent me a video of a nice looking mule and a young girl that could ride better than me. You could see she could ride, but all she did was go circles back and forth, cantering. So what? Did she pick up the feet? Did she show the mule being caught? Did she show the mule being saddled? Did she show the mule side passing, turn on a forehand, turn on a hindquarters? Did she show, in other words, training? Just seeing somebody ride around in a circle or back and forth does not show the animal is trained. It doesn't. Now, did this young girl, can she ride? Oh, yeah. Nice. The nice job. Fairly loose handed. It showed me more than anything else that this mule had a great disposition. It did not show me that this mule would handle well when it come down to, to needing to, to do something. Now, here's the thing. This lady's in Florida. This mule was in another state. Here's the problem, folks. And I know a lot of you can chime in right now and say, yep, Steve hit it right on the money. You cannot believe the people who contact me that went ahead and bought the mule and had it sent to them, and now they got mega problems, okay? Why do they only tell you the good things. Why don't they tell you, well, this mule does have this habit or this mule does do this thing. You don't hear that. All you hear is he meets you at the gate and he's sure a good people mule and things like that. No, folks, when they side pass, turn on four and turn on hind quarters, pick up all four feet, easy to take care of. Yes. Then we're talking about something. Send me that kind of video. But just seeing somebody ride up and down, I'm going to say, you waste your time. Especially if there's no breaching, and especially if there's no rear cinch, don't buy the mule. Jim's watching. Hello, mule lovers. 70 degrees and partly cloudy in Alabama today. Hey, Astra. Yes, it has been a while. School is back in session, she says. Get those good grades. Glad to be back. Let's get you some education. Samantha says, how do you recommend training them, and I'm assuming them as a mule and not your children, for being around gunfire while hunting? Bob supposedly was packed and rode, supposedly was packed and rode for hunting trips prior to us getting him, but we'd like to verify that before even remotely attempting. Uh, Steve, how do you get them prepped for gunfire when hunting? You don't shoot around your mules. Don't do it, folks. One day they'll do just fine, and pretty soon they've had enough, and they're done. Okay, now I know that they got folks that run down through and shoot targets and stuff, and I can tell you that Randy and I have shot rattlesnakes off of our mules with a, with a handgun, but I don't suggest it, okay? I don't do it. I can tell you that one day they'll do really good, and I can tell you a week later, you can't get a gun near them. I can tell you that for sure can happen. But to tell you this, okay, turn this for sure. Here's for sure, is that you can hobble your mule up or tie to a tree, 
go over to a nice place, sit on the side of a rock and pull that trigger. Don't think that, get that out of your mind, folks, that if, if you can shoot around them a couple of times, now they're good forever. No, not going to happen. Great question. Bill is sharing to Mules of Ohio and Indiana. Thank you, Bill. Increasing your domain, I see. 50 degrees with rain moving in. First frost this morning. Stay warm. Ooh. Cowgirl crafter Carolyn is watching. Hi, Steve. Rosie is coming along slow but sure. Um, I was watching a video today of uh, a lot of the work we did with our friend James Montana. And uh, at the very end, you said, hey, we've done all this training. Now let's get out there and ride. And he's like, I don't know about that. You're like, come on, let's just get in the saddle and go. And he says, no, I think I want to do more ground foundation training. And Steve goes, yes, yeah, that's the answer I was looking for. That's what I wanted to hear. So slow is definitely the sure winner right there. Good for you. Hey, Matt is, says, awesome. Thanks, Big. Help working on acquiring more of your tact. That's my next question. Well, send it in here, Matt. We'll get you the right tact. Jerry is watching from Fort Benton, Montana, 57 degrees and blowing 35 to 45 miles an hour. You're probably out of breath if you're blowing that fast. Not a good day to work or ride mules. Better days to come, I hope. I'm sure there will be. Linda's got a question. My older daughter, a horse person and accomplished barrel racer, I know you love her just the same if she's a horse person, has seen me ride Theo and saw me cue him to move forward as you teach, touching my calves to him right, left, instead of touching with both calves at the same time. My daughter said, don't do that. You're going to confuse him. I said, Steve said to, said to do mules this way. Is she right or did I misunderstand Steve? Right, left, right, left, right, left, or at the same time. Right, left, right, brain, listen, left brain, listen to me. Yes, that's correct. Eventually, when the mule has an understanding of the light touch of the calves, only when, then you can use both legs at the same time. But in the meantime, you are building a They have the cranial look, what the right side is doing, left side is doing. A horse. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, all right, we'll do it right. No, of course, one day she's going to pay the price, okay? But you keep on riding that mule like you're doing. Don't pay attention to, to your daughter. We love them anyway, right? We love them anyways. Hey, Kim says, talking about the Sarah abused mule in a small pen to depend on you. Let's see, talking about the abused mule in a small pen to depend on you would be would that be long-term or would that be mule learn to trust and able to roam a bigger pasture? Answer, long-term. Listen, folks, you can't fix in a few days or a couple years what the mule is already experiencing. Everybody thinks it's so romantic. Oh, it's so romantic to see him out there going across the pasture and eating grass and foundering and grass foundering and things like that. Uh, yeah, that's not good. They don't need it, folks. I want you to go. I want you to go and go for the next year and go to a smorgasbord every day to eat. And then call me in a year and tell me how much more you weigh. Okay? Mules, donkeys cannot stand prosperity, folks. They can't. Grass founder is a horrible way to die. I've seen them and I have finished off their life because of it, okay? Don't do it, no, don't do it. They don't need to be out there home on the range, folks. They don't. They need to be in a small corral. You need, and this is why, you wanna take care of your mule, your donkey, correct? Listen, you've got to look at their poop every day. It tells you how healthy they are, how green that road apple is. Yeah, poop, you know, comes up underneath the tail, listen. It tells them, it tells you how healthy they are. Look at their urine. How color is it? It tells you how healthy they are. When you put water in there, turn the automatic water off and see how much water they're taking in every day. It's important that they stay hydrated. Mules and donkeys have a bad reputation for not drinking enough water. Everybody thinks it's great. Well, my mule went all day with no water. That's not good. 
that's not good. You, you get one that dies of acetaria, and that's a horrible disease. Now, let's go on. Now, we go ahead and, uh, uh, and, and, and we still look at the feed. Just because you're feeding hay don't mean it's right for that mule. Don't mean it's right for that donkey. Get you a hair salad, uh, follicle uh, and, and give it to, to somebody to test it and see what they need in the way of vitamins and minerals. Folks, they cannot get enough vitamins and minerals out there on that pasture. They can't do it. They cannot do it. They need vitamins and minerals. And there's a lot of pastures out there that don't have enough. Same thing with the hay. You don't know what's in that hay. You do know if you feed a pellet, because then it says the ingredients. Okay? But, but, but it's, it's romantic, Dave, to take and put, put them out in the pasture. Yeah. And, just, and it's cheaper, too. It's cheaper until they get grass founder. Yeah. Until, they, until they're dying of colic. Then yeah. it's a different story. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a whole nother thing. I put a link in the comments section for folks to check out a Mule and Feed Nutrition Program. Mules can't stand prosperity. Um, uh, Steve was talking about getting a hair follicle sample. Uh, university extension programs will run those for you, um, so you can reach out to your local university see if they have an extension program. But that Mule and Feed Nutrition Program article that's a good one to look at. Uh, Steve recommends Lake and Light. It's not available in a lot of places. Star Milling has a great um, has a great product, and that's available in some places. But if neither is available where you are at, you can take the ingredients that are listed on the Mule Feed and Nutrition Program article that I put a link in the comment uh, to, and you can take that into your feed shop, say, hey, give me whatever you got that's closest to this, and you'll do right by your mule like that. And uh, yeah, a, a lot of folks are quick to look at uh, the way someone may train this way or that way, thinking that the animal is a dog, thinking that the animal is a cat. Uh, it's not. It's an equine. It'll kill you. It'll kill itself. Uh, and, but they look at the way you train and they say, oh, well, that's that's abuse. Number one, no, it's not. Number two, you don't know what's going on on the inside of that animal. And the fact is a lot of abuse happens from the inside out. You'll see all sorts of animals with internal problems that are caused by, caused by malnutrition, lack of vitamins and minerals, uh, poor feeding programs, overfeeding, and all of a sudden you got problems that started on the inside revealing themselves on the outside and it's painful for the animals. So listen to what Steve's talking about. Check out that article. Uh, you're going to do yourself well. Steve, it's 402. Do you have a couple more minutes today? Sure. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. Next question. Uh, this is more of just a comment. Wanted to hear what your thoughts are. Dick sent in a message just uh, talking about Pierce College. He says, "Do you gave a mule vaccinations uh, at the Pierce College. Have you ever made a video or a YouTube giving mules their shots? And so I figured, uh, I figured, hey, Take a couple minutes and talk about what to consider or what people need to know when giving their mules their vaccinations, giving them their shots. You bet. Uh, was he there when when I was given those vaccinations at Pierce College? I recall you telling me about the telling. class you okay. gave at Pierce College. P.S. Leroy is still adverse to shots, but a good mule. Leroy. Very Leroy. All right. All right, folks, look. Uh Giving a, a shot to an animal, uh, especially a mule, they're very sensitive. Uh, they will blow up and they can't hurt you. Okay. I had a mule that was there at the university when I was teaching the class at Pierce College. And there were several veterinarians that had come uh, and or friends and this sort of thing that was going to watch me give, uh, uh, put a needle in a mule's neck. Okay. And what I did was, folks, listen. This is imperative, imperative. You're going to own a mule and donkey. You teach them how a twitch needs to get used. Not one of these twisters that you put on the nose and yank it, put a lot of pressure on them. No, no. This creates natural endorphins, makes them quiet. You can see it in the video. I've got a, I've got a video that, that, uh, that's called Doctoring Your Mule, and it creates natural endorphins. I have castrated mules with it. I have... I have stitched mules with it and you'll see in the video, a mule first throwing his head around and then you'll see us using the twitch. Here's the deal. Let's go back. When you hold a needle. Okay. Uh, wished I had a pin or something around here. I don't have nothing. Okay. When you hold a needle. Yeah, there you go. When you hold a needle, you see how I got my hand here. 
You see that? When you hold a needle, you hold it like that. Hold it like that. Turn your hand. Hit the back of the neck. One, two, three. Notice my hand is open and the needle is supposed to be sticking in the mule's neck. Of course, that's my problem I am. But basically, I hold the needle like this and I go back of my hand. One, two, three, and I put the needle in there. The mule don't know if it's me tapping him with back of my hand or if the needle is in there. They get to where it's like that. Now, I at first trained them with a twitch to do it. And you'll see the kit that I got. It's a how-to video and the twitch, okay? If I might touch on that a little bit. At Pierce College, I actually, people, I was talking to the people over top of the mule, talking to them about different things. They didn't know it, but I was teaching about the twitch. They didn't know it, but I had just put six 18 gauge needles in this mule's neck. And one guy spoke up and says, when are you gonna give the mule the shot? And I turned the mule around and I, they could see there were six 18 gauge needles in the mule's neck. And the mule never flinched one time. It's a wonderful tool. If you got a problem with the ear shy, if you got a problem uh, with picking up feet and stuff, it, this works. Use the come along hitch first, okay? But it's imperative. I train every mule I've ever trained that I, where I learned how to use the twitch, I taught them how to do it. My wife's mule, you put that twitch out toward her and she loves the natural endorphins. She'd go over and put her nose in the twitch and let me put it on. That's how she finally got to it, you know? So here, it's a wonderful tool. So yes, if you're going to give a shot, Especially if you're going to give banamine uh, uh, in the jugular vein, that when you when you push that needle up in there, it's nice to have that natural endorphins kicking in with the mules relaxed. So that's a good tool for him. Good good picture, Dave. Good question. Uh, hey, Yolanda's here watching from the Netherlands. Says I'm not hanging, but sitting in a chair. So there you go. I hope you're feeling better, Yolanda. I'm glad that you're here. We get to see you. James is he watching. Jim is watching from Western Maryland. Overcast, 50 degrees. I saw your comments on some YouTube videos, uh, Jim. Thanks so much. Uh, just for showing up and uh, making yourself known and saying hello. We appreciate it. Samantha says, hi from New York. Not the city, she says. Ha <laughs> ha. We don't have many mules in our area, but they are growing. I see them more and more. And as a horse trainer, I come across mules that people want me to work with. My first mule took me a year to train because I went in it blinded. They are definitely not Horses. Good for you for realizing that. At the time I came across your videos and they helped me wonders. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. I hope someday to own a couple of mules on my own as I have grown to love them more than a horse. Oh my goodness. How about that? We'll just, we'll give a little bit of a, hey, welcome to the family there. We're glad to have you, Samantha. Thanks for tuning in. Matt says, saddle question. Definitely looking to buy one of your saddles, but curious if they come in any lighter color. Most of them are pretty dark. Can can anything be done to lighten them up, Steve, uh, post-purchase the leather? Here's the problem with colors, Dave. What I see is a lighter color. Other people may say is too light. What I see is a lighter color. Other people may think is too dark. Why don't I do them in a lighter color? Here it is. It shows up scratches super easy. You go through the brush, you're going to get scratches. You take it off the mule and throw it in a trailer, you're going to get scratches. The good thing about the darker hide is that all you got to do is rub a little oil on it and the scratches kind of disappear. Okay. That's the reason. Okay. Uh, I would love to say, yep, I can do your lighter color but I would have a difficult time with it because what you consider light and what I consider light is two different things. Just do like, the reason I do this, the reason I, reason I do them the one color, is like Henry Ford said, paint it black and sell it. So that's what I do. I just put it a, a, a good color. It's my colors. It's not another color like it on other saddles. So again, I differentiate myself in cat in saddles by color 
by design and also by my logo. There you go. There is only one place to get Steve Edwards tack and saddles and instruction, and that's at muleranch.com. So if you want to check it out, you can go do that. Uh, let's see here. Linda says that video of picking up the feet always cracks up. Uh, notice Steve really wants badly to whack her with his baseball cap but restrains himself. You notice that too, Linda? <laughs> uh, let's see. Bonnie, hi from Homestead, Florida. I'm late because I was out feeding my mule. Please, did you show how to loop a lariat into a come-along hitch? What's a lariat? Well, lariat's my come-along rope. Oh, oh, and, oh. And, yeah. And we have, we've got lots of videos. Matter of fact, if you bought the come-along rope uh, kit, if you bought the kit, it would show you on there not only how to put it on, but it shows you how to use it. Now, I've got a lot of folks, Dave, who just buy only the halter or just the come along rope, buy that only, and then say, all right, now what do I do? Well, they watch a few videos thinking, okay, we got it, you know, and they don't. That's why I have the kit. So I'm putting videos showing come along rope install. I've got, I think it's five videos here that I created a playlist on Steve's YouTube channel. Uh, you can go to that link and it's four videos. You can go to that link and see Steve put it on four different ways. Uh, actually, it's uh, one of Steve's apprentices putting it on in one video. So not only do you see Steve, you see other people do it. Um, it is a little bit tricky, but once you get it, you got it and you're good. Uh, Cowboy Ken says, I'm late, but hello. Better late than never. Cowboy Ken, glad you're here. Uh, cowgirl says still have not ridden her still working on groundwork. Good for you. Make sure you've got the come along rope, the rope halter and the problem mule video cowgirl. Linda says, hooray. I'll tell Elizabeth. You said, don't pay any attention to your daughter. Wow. She had that one loaded up real quick. Teresa says, hello, Terry and Roger from upstate New York. It's chilly and windy. Thanks for all you do. I agree. Thank you, Steve. Yolanda says, my mule is on a small patch of the paddock and she is mad. So she is pulling her water trough through, uh, water trough, uh, water through her hay trough because she is bored, but still kind of mule happy brain when she sees me. Well, that's good. Michelle says, Steve, I requested Ed a video of everything. Uh, I want to see with this mule that's for sale that he can, what he can do, feet, etc. Can't wait to get this video. I will have a PPE with x-rays done, feet and scapula. Yes. You want to get that stuff done. You're about to drop. doesn't matter how much you get the mule for. The food, the quarters, the truck, the trailer, you're about to go in, who knows how many tens of thousands of dollars, spend a few hundred dollars, get the medical work done. Marsha says, I love these videos. We love you, Marsha. Hello from Montana. Is Steve Mule Rider Martingale the best way to start a new to me eight-year-old mule who ignores the bit? Been doing groundwork before getting in the saddle. Steve, what would you say to Marsha? Awesome, doing the groundwork, far more important than putting a mule rider's martingale on there. Far more important. Folks, you cannot do enough come along work. It, it helps, if the best thing it does is it helps your timing, getting the animal to respond. It progresses your hands so that they're correct. So the mule rider's martingale is my go-to bridle. I will not ride anything. I don't care how broke people say it is, and I've ridden mules on the Sinai Desert in Egypt. I've been in Australia. You know, I've ridden mules all over the place. Brazil, uh, you know, I've been, I've ridden all these mules. Get this in your mind. I didn't use their bits. I'm not gonna do it. I have control with my mule riders martingale. On the side of a mountain, in snow, crossing water, that bridle has saved my bacon when I've had problems, okay? Get that in your mind. Do, do, can you go on to other bits and do a little finish work? Yes, but you are going to have to tune. And that tuning device is the Sir Single, Sir Single, and the Mule Riders Martingale. I just put a link in the comment section to the Mule Riders Martingale if you all want to go check it out. If you've got your own bridle, you still need the Mule Riders Martingale bridle. If you've got your own bit, you still need the Mule Riders Martingale bit. There are nuances in the way those are designed 
that are unlike anything else. And it's not that way just to say it's that way. It's that way because it didn't exist and it needed to. Um, I'll speak for Steve. There was no intention ever to start creating saddles, no intention to start designing bits, no intention to start doing cinches and all of these other things. What happened was Steve didn't get the results he wanted with the mule or the donkey and said, well, hey, why is that? And over time, learned how to do things, said, hey, if it works for me, I can help it work for other folks. So really, Queen Valley Mule Ranch is an extension of appreciation for the mules and the donkeys. It's not just a business. It is an extension of appreciation so you can get results. And the beauty of it is that Steve's been able to turn it into a business to where now he can help you all the time. We could do things like this. So uh, Ron and Virginia are watching. Uh, we are late, but wanted to say hello. We really appreciate that. Honestly, that means a lot. Uh, Yolanda says, oh, the one, two, three needle tactic is not going to work with my mule. She will kill the vet in an instant and she bends the needle straight on. So uh, let us know what works for your mule because I'm sure there's something uh, someone that's going to say, hey, I want to know what works for Yolanda's mule, that Spanish mule. Carla is watching from northern British Columbia, Canada, windy and cold. Great to see you. It's great to be seen. This will be the second to last question we got. We'll get to Linda's right after this. Carolyn says, question on groundwork. Do they get bored? Do you change it up? Steve, does the mule get bored and do you change it up? Uh, I don't really call it bored. They get to where they'd rather they get to looking away from you. And it's no different than being on a trail. Do I change it up? Yes. I would set myself up a trail course and I would go over the trail course, over the river and through the woods, across tarps, uh, on top of bridges. Yes, I would do that stuff. But I would first do my basics first, as you see it on that video. Yes, they do. And, and, and the boredom, it's only because you're not paying attention, only because you're not touching their nose. If they look over, it's too late. You got to do it when the ear thinks about it, or you got to do it when the nose thinks about it. Okay. That's when it goes. If they've already turned, if they've already moved, that was not their fault. It was your fault. You didn't bump them fast enough. So, uh, you know, the, the thing with spending time with this stuff is that, we want to do steps of to build a foundation. Steps of three, six, nine, twelve. Get that in your mind. Today I'm going to do three. Go around the right, go around the left, and the three good ones. I can stop on a good note. I'm done. A week later, not the next day, not an hour later. You can wait as long as you want. A week later, do those three, and they look really good. They're consistent. Then do three more. Now you got six and work your way up to 12. When they can do it on a light touch and <laughs> you barely touch the, the come along rope, that's when you are doing it right. Awesome, I checked the last comment and that was from Linda to me. So, hey, we are good folks. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. It really is a privilege to have you here. I wanna remind you to go sign up for Steve's event, November 17, it's free but you have to register. So uh, if the day comes and you don't have an invite, you won't be able to get in. So go register, get signed up. We're gonna talk all about bits. We're gonna talk all about the bits you should be using, the right bit for the job, getting results with a bit, what you need to know about bits, what you shouldn't do with the bit. We're going to talk about everything to do with bits. And when you walk away from that, you will feel like you are in the saddle, so to speak, when it comes to bits. Steve, is there anything you want to say before we are all done here? You know, Dave, we got some awesome people come and, and pay, spend time with us. Every you know week. What? Yeah, every week. Awesome people. I'd like to do something special for them. Every week, I'm going to have a Queen Valley Mule Ranch, Steve Edwards designed bridal, leather bridal. And every week, I'm going to hold this bridal off and I'm going to send it to whoever can answer my question. My question may say, what's my wife's mule's name? Hey. What was my first mule's name? What, how long do I use a come along hitch? And if I, if I say that question 
and they click on there and say, I got the answer. I'm going to send, get this in your mind, I'm going to send that bridal to them. I don't care if you're in Australia or if you're in Russia or in New York City. Yeah, I'm going to send it. All right. I'm going to send it. I'm going to have a bridal worth a hundred bucks and I'm going to hold it up and say, what do you think, Dave? Is that going to be fun? I think that's going to be great. Y'all are really going to enjoy that. So be sure to hang out with us each week. Y'all are going to have a lot of fun and we've got some bridles that Steve is going to be pulling in. Hey, uh, be sure, go sign up for the event right there. You see the registration page. Uh, we can't wait for the event and we can't wait to see you there. Thank you for spending some time with us today and uh, we'll talk to you next week. See you everybody. Bye, 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 bye.